show of hands, how many of you know your second cousins? Quite a few of you. How many know your third cousins? I'm impressed. Does anyone here have a relationship with your fourth cousin? I think I see one hand. That's impressive. There are many who don't even know all of their first cousins, let alone fourth cousins. Mm -hmm. Now, suppose a third cousin, who maybe you just sort of knew, asked you if they could come spend the weekend with you. Would you be likely to open up your home to them? or give them the phone number for a nearby motel. <laughs> I'm not quite sure what I would do. I, I think it might depend on which branch of the family tree I knew them from. Well, Catherine is a former youth of mine now studying at California Lutheran University. And her great uncle, began the hard work of tracing their genealogy and looking all through their family tree. And in doing so, connected with some distant relatives that they didn't really know they had. You know, they suspected they had them. Most people have you know, third or fourth cousins, but they didn't know their names before. And now they do. And Last year, Catherine briefly got to meet her second cousin, twice removed, when they came to visit in California. Well, this fall, Catherine is studying abroad in Italy, in Florence. And it's just a train ride away from these distant cousins. And so they invited her to come and spend the weekend with them. And she went, not quite sure what to expect from you know, distant relatives who she'd only met once. But when she got off the train, they welcomed her with open arms and embraced her the way you embrace family. <coughs> And then they gave her a first-class tour of the town. They showed her the palace and government buildings and the museum. All the while, they struggled to speak English to Catherine so that she would feel welcome and comfortable, even though she was the one visiting their country. Well, this town is one that I really want to go to because they are known for chocolate. <laughs> and so they took Catherine to some of their specialty chocolate shops so that they could sample some sweets. And she said it was amazing. And so she decided to get a few boxes or bags um, to bring back home to her friends and family here in California. Except when she went to purchase them, these second and third cousins insisted on paying for her presence for her friends and family. I would have never thought of doing that. But that's the way they were. And then when they got back to their home, they put together a warm bath for Catherine to soak in, complete with jacuzzi, jets, and candlelight. She was treated like royalty. At dinner, more cousins came, more third and fourth cousins came, and they ate and talked and laughed all night as if they had known each other forever. I mean, she said she wasn't sure the last time she slept so well as that night. 
And then the next day, they gave her more of a tour of the town, and they talked about their family and shared stories and pictures. And when Catherine got back on that train to head to Florence, she wasn't leaving behind distant relatives. She was leaving close family who she was bonded with, who, though she had nothing to contribute other being, than being herself. That was the exact reason why they loved her, simply because of who she was. Well, in John's Gospel today, we hear of a gathering of, of community, but under heartbreaking circumstances this time. <clears throat> Jesus' friend Lazarus has died, and Jesus was not there when it happened. When he finally arrived at the village four days later, he first spoke with one of Lazarus's sisters, and then with the other. And it was heartening to know that these women had not been left alone in their grief. They were surrounded by community. Now, in that place and time, it is quite reasonable to imagine that this community is made up of relatives. There were probably a lot of first and second and third and fourth cousins and aunts and uncles. I think we can consider them all church family. The way we are church family. Some of you all I look out are connected by bloodlines and some through marriage, but all of us are connected through our faith in a loving God. And just like the way we come together, this church family came together. And you can be assured that there were those in that church family that had been busy preparing their version of a funeral casserole. And there were some who were just with them, crying with them, praying with them. And there were some who were making decisions about what tomb Lazarus' body should be laid to rest in and making all the other practical arrangements, like someone has to do. And as Jesus came into the midst of this church family, when he saw Mary weeping, and then when he saw the church family weeping, he too began to weep. Because he also loved Lazarus. They were friends. They were like family. And so when Jesus asked to see the tomb where Lazarus had been laid, the church family went with. Maybe partly because they were curious, but also they wanted to support him. Sometimes we need to be surrounded when we go to the grave, when we see that tomb. But when Jesus asked for the stone to be moved, well, then the church family hesitated because they know that death doesn't always smell pretty. But then they complied. Maybe because of Jesus' authority, or maybe they thought this was some important step of his grieving process. And then Jesus called Lazarus out of the tomb. And through <coughs> no good deed or work on Lazarus's part, he was just lying there. He was restored to his community. 
Jesus had called Lazarus out. But then it was the crowd, the community, the church family, who was called upon to serve to unbind Lazarus. What I hear in this passage from John's Gospel to this morning, what I hear in Catherine's experience in Italy, is what it means to be a communion of saints. What it means to be a church family. That we are there for each other. That we lean on each other. That we bend so our siblings don't need to break. Any community of saints is full of sinners. And yet we still accept one another despite our faults and failures. We lift one another up to be the best we can be, and we meet each other where we are. In church family, we receive grace, and we give grace. Just as Lazarus hadn't been doing anything to be worthy or deserving of Jesus calling him out of the tomb, and and Catherine hadn't done anything worthy of receiving such radical hospitality other than being who they were. Likewise, we freely give to bring others joy. And not just those nearby who we've met face to face, who we've prayed with and played with. We, we do this for those who are thousands of miles away, who we might not have any common strands of DNA. Because John shared earlier in his gospel how God so loves the cosmos. That means we're all connected. Those who we have known each other our entire lives and those across the globe who we don't look like or pray like or live like. Together, we are one. Together, we unbind each other. And yes, of course, it's quite possible to believe in Jesus all by ourselves. And sure, you can be a Christian without being a part of a worshiping community. But we are stronger together. In church family, we laugh together and we cry together. We pray together, and we play together. We are the communion of saints. And we work as the body of Christ to care for all of God's people. And the world God made. Working to bring justice and peace. And unbinding one another. Not because anyone is deserving, but because of who we are, God's beloved children, and because of who they are, God's beloved children. We are siblings. We are cousins. We are family. 